Good afternoon. We just heard a very concerning briefing from Special Envoy of the Secretary General for the Great Lakes Region, Saeed Jinnit, about the situation in Burundi. This is the third time the Council has come together just in the last month to address the need for all parties in Burundi to refrain from violence and intimidation before, during, and after elections and to actively support the conditions for a peaceful, timely, credible, and inclusive elections process. What we are seeing is a Burundi sliding into violent turmoil. The intensity of the violence has increased this week. Live rounds, water cannons, and arbitrary arrests have been used against protesters. We've now seen reports of grenade attacks. While reports on total numbers of those killed and arrested vary, we know that on May 4th, at least three protesters were shot dead. On May 6th, another half dozen people were reportedly killed. And over the last three days, we've started to see more gruesome attacks against alleged members of the Mbamanakuri, including a lynching and separate burning. Amidst this increase in violence, refugee flows into Rwanda, Tanzania, and the DRC have skyrocketed to over 50,000 people. Any further violence carries with it the risk of irreversible consequences, not just for Burundian citizens, but for the people of the Great Lakes region writ large. This violence is due to two very foreseeable and very preventable events. First, President Nkurunziza's decision to seek a third term, which the United States has clearly stated is a violation of the Arusha Agreement. Despite warnings from multiple parts of Burundian society and the international community that such a move would lead to violence, Nkurunziza decided to move forward. He rejected and indeed was extremely dismissive of the possibility that his moving out in abrogation of the Arusha Agreement would generate protests and would result in violence. He ruled that out out of hand. Um, and now we are seeing, unfortunately, the consequence of his decisions and of his dismissiveness of these risks. Second, the government's continued and relentless crackdown against the people's rights to peacefully protest and freely express their views has itself increased violence. The severe restrictions placed on the media, traditional and social, have only exacerbated these problems. While the government claims that President Nkurunziza's third term is constitutional, and the constitutional ruling this week supported that finding, we must underscore the apparent lack of judicial impartiality that led to this decision. The Vice President of Burundi's Constitutional Court fled to safety in Rwanda this week and refused to succumb to the government's pressure to validate President Nkurunziza's third term. This Vice President said judges, quote, were subjected to enormous pressure and even death threats, end quote, stating that, quote, those opposed to a third term violating the Constitution and the Arusha Agreement were afraid because they were put under pressure. We risk our lives, he said, so judges had to get behind the third term and join the camp supporting it, end quote. We welcome the leadership being shown by the region. The foreign ministers of Rwanda, Tanzania, Kenya, and Angola were in Burundi this week to engage all parties to seek a way out of the crisis. The heads of state of the East African community will meet next week in Dar es Salaam, where we hope the crisis in Burundi is front and center, and we have every reason to believe it will be. We also welcome African Union Chairwoman Lemini Zuma's statement yesterday that Nkurunziza should not seek a third term, and that what is most important at this critical time is to ensure a peaceful environment conducive to elections. The government of Burundi has a window to stop and reverse the outbreak of violence by agreeing to allow for peaceful protests, easing restrictions to media, respecting human rights, and preventing violence by the Mbamakuri and the security forces. To date, neither President Nkurunziza nor his government has condemned the violence by the youth militia or called for restraint by the police. We urge them to do so immediately, Failure to take these steps will only heighten the scale of violence and increase the risk of this turning into a regional crisis. With that, I'm happy to take a few questions. Ambassador, thank you. Um, what more can the Council do on this issue, um, given that Russia has sort of made clear that they think it's a constitutional issue that the Council shouldn't get involved in? 
did you raise the possibility of threatening sanctions? And what can you tell us about these reports that the President's um, security are distributing weapons throughout the country and training militia? Um, how concerned are you by this and what do you know about it? Okay, let me get all this. Um, let me just uh, start with uh, the reports that you mentioned. Um, you might recall that uh, now, more than six months ago, the security advisor to the prior UN mission in Burundi was expelled from Burundi uh, because of the leak of a report alleging the massive distribution of weapons to the Mbama Furi. Uh, now we hear that some of those weapons are being used. Uh, we hear of threats by the youth militia uh, toward people who peacefully protest against President Kurinziza's decision uh, to uh, pursue a, a third term. These are extremely alarming reports. Uh, there is no question uh, that there are weapons uh, in the hands of people who are not affiliated with the traditional security establishment, with the armed forces uh, and with the police. And the fact that these reports are increasing, not decreasing, the fact that prior reports uh, appear to be credible, and the fact that the government's only response to those reports was in effect to shoot the messenger, not literally, thankfully, but uh, to expel uh, the BNUP security advisor and indeed to end the prior mission, which had much more of a monitoring role uh, than the current uh, election-related mission. These are all extremely worrying facts. In terms of sanctions, let me just say that the United States is very carefully monitoring the situation, uh, and we are prepared to take targeted measures, including visa bans or sanctions, against those who plan or participate uh, in widespread violence uh, of the kind that we all fear. Uh, the United Nations Security Council has threatened action, uh, and it remains to be seen what action the Council would come together uh, in support of. I think for all of the um, disagreement perhaps here or there about uh, the Constitution, uh, there is no disagreement about the need for the Council to do everything in its power to prevent the situation from spiraling out of control. I mean, the Council is alarmed. I don't think there's been a period, uh, maybe even in the last decade, where the Council has met this many times on Burundi consecutively. So right now we're emphasizing support for Sajinit, who's actually trying uh, to bring the parties together and see if there's a peaceful way out of this crisis. And I think we'll, we'll get at the what are the next steps, uh, again, if these negotiations cannot uh, bear fruit. You have been to Bangui not once but twice. So I must ask you, in light of these horrific allegations, are you satisfied uh, that both France and the United Nations initiated this investigation quickly enough, made sure that the soldiers were removed from that mission quickly enough, and that all the uh, steps towards accountability have been taken? And related, does this um, draw new attention to all the, the reforms that have been called for in the past on how to handle sex abuse and peacekeeping? Uh, thank you for the question. It's an extremely important one. The allegations are completely horrific. The, you know, the, the fact that uh, soldiers who are entrusted with the protection of civilians, the protection of young people, uh, if these allegations prove true, uh, again, it is such a profound violation uh, not only of the dignity and physical security of individuals in, a, in their most vulnerable state, um, but it is a complete abrogation of trust uh, between those who are alleged to come as protectors uh, and uh, those who, who violate that trust and take advantage of 
again, the most acute vulnerability any of us can imagine uh, experiencing, a, a vulnerability that comes from being desperate for food, for being desperate uh, for protection. So we don't know, again, uh, the full facts of the case at this stage, that that is the case of the, the, the allegations of sexual abuse, whether those will be borne out. Uh, they're certainly very credible and very disturbing uh, allegations. Uh, so it is essential that those countries whose soldiers uh, are alleged to have been involved in crimes of this magnitude uh, act aggressively uh, to track down the facts and to punish anybody uh, responsible. In terms of the UN uh, and the member states handling of the issue, uh, I think it is extremely important that an impartial investigation be done also of that on top of investigating the allegations themselves. When allegations like this are made, and sadly this is not the first time uh, that peacekeepers have been accused of uh, sexual abuse of civilians uh, who've put their faith uh, in the international community, um, when allegations like these are made, speed is essential, absolutely imperative, because for as long, potentially, as crimes like this are being committed, uh, then individuals are vulnerable to the same individuals who are alleged to be carrying out the crimes. Uh, the safety of those who are brave enough to come forward, notwithstanding having potentially been abused, um, the safety of those individuals, those witnesses, the confidentiality uh, of their testimony, that's also essential. So there are a number of elements to the appropriate handling of cases like this, and we need this impartial investigation of the handling uh, to be carried out swiftly. Um, we need all individuals, both in member states, themselves and within the UN organization who were involved uh, in uh, the handling of this, again, grave and grotesque set of allegations uh, to involve themselves and come forward and make everything that they know available. And the, I think the investigation needs to span, again, from start to finish, um, because there were a lot of different stages to this. Uh, but we need a system here uh, number one, where peacekeepers uh, are vetted appropriately before they go into the field. Number two, at the slightest hint uh, that peacekeepers could be carrying out abuses, that needs to be reported up the chain uh, and investigated extremely swiftly. Um, and we, again, like everyone, are concerned about the length of time between the alleged crimes and the, the, the time at which uh, the uh, appropriate authorities were made aware and the lag between the time at which the appropriate authorities took the required action. Follow-up on that, quick follow-up? One question. Follow Thanks, I appreciate it. Um, one issue that's arisen that, that may not even need to wait for an investigation is that the Central African Republic says that they were never told of this. And given that these were their citizens, I wonder, do, does the U.S. think when the UN system becomes aware of charges such as these, that the host country should be told. There's also this issue in the UN Dispute Tribunal ruling that the Under Secretary General of Peacekeeping was reported, and the UN didn't seem to dispute it, to have said that the whistleblower should be should resign or be suspended. And I wonder, this seems like a pretty serious charge. What what do you think of that? Do you think do you think that that is 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 appropriate? What do you think of the treatment of the whistleblower who brought it to light? I think on. A lot of these issues, we're all going to be better off if we allow an impartial investigation uh, to take hold. And I think you raise a really, really important issue about uh, host country involvement, and we'd want to, again, get the facts on that. Um, and certainly it is the case that um, uh, the host country uh, itself uh, of course, has the sovereign responsibility for the protection of its citizens. And uh, so looking at what role Central African Republic authorities played or didn't play has to be part of this. And then in terms of the individual who uh, disclosed the allegations, um, uh, who worked for the Office of the High Commissioner for the Human Rights, again, 
it's extremely important uh, that any individual who comes into possession of uh, allegations of this gravity uh, act swiftly. Uh, it is also extremely important uh, that victim and witness safety uh, be a very uh, s significant primary uh, consideration as well. And so again, the impartial investigation will look at the handling and how both the issue of speed uh, and the issue of uh, victim and witness uh, protection, how, how those issues were handled. Ambassador, back to Burundi. I wanted you to talk about the, the way the international uh, architecture is set up. There's been a lot of criticism from Burundians themselves that the international community has moved very slowly on this issue. The fact that we do have a few thousand refugees when, when the international community has been very well aware of what was going to happen. Uh, what can you say about how the international uh, community response to these issues given what we're seeing in South Sudan and Syria today? Um, well, I think the international community as represented by the UN Security Council uh, has actually been quite aggressive in the preventive diplomacy phase. I mean, the fact that just two months ago or whenever it was, we all traveled all the way to Burundi as a way of sending a message to President Kurenziza about what the risks were if he went ahead in violation of the letter and the spirit of the Arusha agreements. That's actually quite unusual. And everybody on the Security Council, just as in the broader international community, is well aware of the history in Burundi and, of course, in the broader region and how quickly political disputes can get, uh, can descend into uh, ethnic disputes. And Arusha enshrined a social compact that has allowed Burundi to make tremendous progress. And, you know, for the sake of Burundians who suffered so much and worked so hard to reconcile and to get to the place that they uh, have gotten to in terms of stability, including relative political stability, for that to be uh, endangered, sub-regional organizations sent the message that that was in peril. Regional organizations sent that message, including Lamini Zuma, not just yesterday, but over the course of recent months. And the Security Council traveled all the way there to send that message. I myself have been to, been to Burundi uh, twice in the, in the last year to send that message. Uh, I believe the first cabinet member to travel to Burundi in, in uh, a very long time on behalf of President Obama in order to send that message. So, you know, it is clear that things are not going well in Burundi and all of us wanna learn if there was more that we could have done. But at the end of the day, President Kurenziza has to put his people first. The international community can't make him uh, privilege the welfare of his people, privilege the end of violence uh, over his own personal desire to seek a third term. He has to make that choice. Uh, and I think the message from the international community was loud and clear, uh, and it's a message that he has chosen not to hear. I'll, I'll just do that real quick. Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of the diplomatic discussions, um, but you all know that Resolution 2118, best remembered as the resolution that dismantled Syria's declared chemical weapons program, bans the use of chemical weapons. And you know that Resolution 2209 the chlorine resolution makes very clear that the use of chlorine as a weapon is chemical weapons use. And we heard in the ARIA session devastating reports, I believe you all met as well with the doctors who treated uh, the victims of chlorine attacks. So we believe, uh, and it's clear that many council members agree, that we have got to have a means of establishing who is carrying out these chlorine attacks. To us, the fact-finding missions report was very clear from the OPCW. It described hundreds of witnesses with the same symptoms, witnesses who died, uh, excuse me, victims who died without a cut on their bodies just because they suffocated on these gas, on this gas, and witnesses who described the smell of chlorine emanating at just the moment a helicopter came and dropped a barrel bomb on, 
a particular building. The victims themselves smell like chlorine. Uh, there are no allegations of how uh, chlorine uh, could be um, uh, dispersed in the manner the OPCW has described it has been dispersed. Uh, absent, again, these air attacks, everybody who has been interviewed has described uh, a correlation between uh, the chlorine-related deaths and the dropping uh, of uh, what appear to be chlorine barrel bombs from helicopters, and as you know, only the regime has helicopters. So we, we believe the factual record is, is quite straightforward and devastating uh, in terms of Syrian regime use. But it is, as a factual matter, true that no one in the international system is mandated to establish attribution for these attacks, and we need to fix that. So we hope uh, to, that we can make progress on a resolution to ensure that there is a mechanism that will not only establish chlorine use, but establish who carried out that use. Thanks, everyone. On your left.